Yechi Amalek HaMashiach, my name is Yossi Edri. Today we are going to tackle the biggest issues humanity has been talking about, struggling with, and we're going to give you all the solutions you need from Judaism. Let's try this. So, vegan, the vegan community, people that decide that killing animals is cruel, killing and slaughtering flesh and blood just like yourself um, is cruel and we're going to stop killing animals completely and we're going to eat only fruits and vegetables or maybe it's the healthy choice and blah 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 so is this a good thing a bad thing what's the deal where does it originate the answers can be found in the Bible just like Judaism claims to answer everything in the Bible the answer to that is is that many years ago the vegan people were all people. People did not start eating meat till after the flood, the flood in the time of Noah. So as he left the ark, God gave him the seventh commandment, which Adam had six, and then God gave Noah the seventh commandment, thus giving the seven laws of Noah the name, because he made them seven, um, not to eat from the animal while it's still alive. Veganism, is it healthy? It's not a right, the right choice. It used to be the right choice, and now it's not the right choice. People were strong enough. They were able to eat cucumbers and tomatoes and whatever grew in the land, and that kept them strong enough uh, to be able to function and serve God or do whatever they want. As it turns out, do whatever they want. Um, so that time is over. After that, God weakened the people, made four seasons, and also allowed people to eat meat in order to elevate the meat um, and in Kabbalistic uh, thought it's it's uh, presumed that the reason why God allowed people to kill animals is because they needed to now spill blood in order to atone for the blood that they spilled the human blood that they spilled so now God is going to allow them and command them how to treat animals in a humane way and that will be an atonement for what they did to their fellow man and uh, that's why in the Jewish way of slaughtering it's made sure to done with a very very sharp knife the the sheikhet which is the man who slaughters the animals wakes up really really early uh, three four five six in the morning and he'll sharpen his knife for four hours before he'll work he'll have you know big uh, noise cancellation devices and he'll r roll his finger up and down after he sharpens them on the stones and with the water um, and he'll make sure that there's not one indent in the knife and it's something that takes a lot of time and when he slaughters the animal he cannot feel any um, you know um, hesitation in the knife it has to be one two a very smooth stroke and it has to be 100% painless to the animal and that doing all that can be an atonement for a man's sins and we as we know in the in the in the temple there were sacrifices and as we know the Jewish people till this very day make sure to wave a chicken around their head and they they slaughter it as well and give it to needy families the ones that are obviously um, kosher and so on so Veganism used to be a thing. It's not a thing anymore. Now we need to um, eat meat in order to stay healthy and strong. And I'll just add a small story from the Holocaust. Uh, there was a Jewish rabbi that was brought to the concentration camp together with his family. And he was not willing whatsoever to put any piece of meat that's not kosher into his mouth. And at that time in the concentration camp, they gave them a really small piece of bread, a little bit of water, and uh, some horse meat. And he was not willing whatsoever to eat the horse meat. And within two weeks, he died because it wasn't enough for him to live off the water and the bread. Obviously, no one's going to die today if they don't eat meat. But it just goes to say that there are some stuff in meat that you, your body needs, and you shouldn't just think that you're doing you the world a favor by avoiding this because this is the way God created it and of course there's many 
people that go into this at length and say the only reason why animals are raised today is in order to slaughter them later, just like the Bible says that the people will control the animal kingdom. So to say that killing animals is a sin, you have to know that the, the animal was bred from, from the beginning by the farmer in order to slaughter it. And if no one would eat meat, there would be no, it would basically cancel out the whole meat con conversation from the economy, let's say, and then no animals would really have any protection because certain animals can't uh, fend in the wild on their own, and so on and so on. So the whole vegan concept falls apart on many, many levels. And uh, just to throw something into the mix, the Nazis were very big animal rights activists, but obviously um, when it came to human rights, they were very, very weak. And I can go on and on. And this is stuff that also the Lubavitcher Rebbe mentioned. So basically... The source of veganism is a good one, and it comes from a you know special place. But is it, you know, connected to what we need today? No, it's not. Is it practical? No. Okay, um, the male-female crisis. This is something that's going on in America. I did speak about identity crisis in general, and I did make another video, but I think I didn't go into the male-female concept enough. And there's also some stuff in the Bible that could help us out over here. Now the truth is, just go look in the Bible, Adam was born, Adam Marishan was born alone. He was born by himself and then God took a part of him out and created the woman. Now besides that there's of course the sages which tell us a little bit more and give us a little bit um, more into what happened over there. And they tell us that Adam had a face in the front and he had a face on the back of his head. And when God took Eve out of him he also took the face from behind and gave it to Eve so in other words Adam was whole and one and he was able to reproduce and do anything that today takes a man and women he was able to do it alone in his own creation mechanism that Hashem created him um, obviously after God split him or you know turned him inside out so now there was two, there was the male and the female, and now they'll need each other in order to recreate, to create and to fulfill their mission in the world. Um, in Hasidic philosophy, this is discussed at length, and it's discussed as two kinds of ways to uh, have a relationship with God. One is back-to-back, -back, and the other one is face-to-face. -face. And the face-to-face -face approach is more um, likable in the higher spheres, and therefore, that is the right approach face to face. And there would only be able to be this face to face approach in the service of God if Adam and Eve would pretty much split. So that's why it sort of um, happened like that. And that basically um, is a good thing to know as a foundation um, for the whole male, female, and everything in between kind of concept. Because, in essence, if you really want to tickle your brain, we all are both. But right now, if you were born a man, stay a man. And if you were born a woman, stay a woman. Because now you, um, of course, have a lot of com compatibility with your opposite, um, you know, if you're a male or a female. But um, you shouldn't think that there's an issue with you or wh whatever. It's just the compatibility that you're feeling. Of course, um, it's a known fact that the government has been involved in pretty much drugging up the food and doing a lot of things to mix up people, um, you know, by making men feel like women and women feel like men. This is a kind of tactic that we see even in Egypt. When the Jews were slaves in Egypt, it says that Pharaoh gave all the men work to the women and all the women work to the men just in order to torture them and to drive them crazy. Why am I bringing this up is, again, because there is a male-female function, but the fact is if you were born a man, stay a man, and, and identify as a man and serve God as a man. And if you're born a woman, stay a woman and identify as a woman and, and, and serve God as a woman. Animal rights. When Adam was in the Garden of Eden right before the sin, the animals listened to him. If he told the birds, I want you guys to start you know, dancing for me in the sky and chirping, making some nice music, they would do it happily. But after he sinned, the animals were like, listen, you sinned to God, we don't care about you anymore. And 
it says that in the time of Noah, they were very happy that he was born because when he was born, all of a sudden the horses and the, the donkeys, they started listening to the people and allowing themselves to be tamed by the people. And he also, Noah built a lot of tools um, and in his time, um, which helped people, um, you know, uh, clear up their fields and so on and so forth. It used to be that the animal kingdom 100% listened to the mankind, whatever they said, and there was a complete healthy relationship. But after the Adam and Eve sinned, the animals pretty much said, you're not listening to your creator, we're not going to listen to you in this world. So hopefully when we do enough repentance and we find favor in God's eyes and we make this world a better place, um, that will be reversed. Man was created last, but at the same time, the rest of the world was created to help him serve God and under his guidance serve God. So the animals are supposed to help us serve God. This is the Jewish perspective. I have to address it because there's so much talk about it now in the news. A lot of people that are involved in this are getting arrested and slammed in the slammer for eternity. God bless the judges and the people who are protecting human rights especially in cases where it was done in a very disgusting manner, forcefully and so on. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, pedophiles that and, and pedophile organizations, if you might, that basically say, oh, what's the big deal to marry, a, you know, a kid if he's consenting and so on and so forth. Now, the thing is like this, um, a child... You know, you look in the Bible and you look at the, even in the time of Muhammad, I'm not taking him as an example because I don't know how he did it and what he did and I'm not sure he was exactly the righteous guy and he only took upon himself his own religion later on in the in the story. Uh, Isaac married uh, Rivka when she was about three years old. And you can't compare um, that and use that as a um, argument against what's happening today because... At that time, it was different, and the way a person grew and developed and um, was exposed to the world um, was a different process, and it was done in a different way. And also, the Bible wasn't given back then. Now, someone might tell me, what are you trying to tell me, that uh, an age limit um, is spoken about in the Bible? Well, sort of, because we know that a bar mitzvah, which means the, the, the child becomes 13 or 12, um, which makes him eligible to fulfill the commandments of the Bible, um, is a Jewish thing from the Bible. Um, and in the time of Rivka, there were different uh, concepts within the human race, and I can go through a few of them. Number one, in the time of Abraham, um, if someone sneezed, then he would die. That was the end of his life. So a person could be walking around, and of course, people lived for a lot, many, much more time than we live today, um, for hundreds of years and so on. So a person sneezed and he died. So that was one thing that was very different than today. Also, a person didn't get sick before he died. He just, boom, disappeared. So the sneeze thing and not getting sick, didn't warn anyone before the person died. Another thing that was different was the person did not look older. You couldn't tell how old someone is just from looking at him. And, and uh, Abraham and Isaac looked exactly like twins, and people didn't know who to respect. That's how similar they were, even though Abraham was 90, 99 when he had a, a bris, a circumcision, and 101 or something, or 100 when when uh, Isaac was born. But um, Isaac, being his child at the age of, let's say, 5 or 10, all walking alongside Abraham, nobody could tell who is who. Therefore, Abraham prayed to God that there should be a way that um, you can see the age of a person. And... So that was a new development. And later, um, uh, Jacob prayed to God that you should become sick before you pass away. So you should have time to um, take care of the things that need to be taken care of before a person passes away. So there's a few things that changed um, as humanity progresses. Um, 
and it's not fair and it's not accurate to compare what happened thousands of years ago to what's happening today. Obviously, again, um, the Bible was given at Mount Sinai and ever since then the world has to adhere to the Word of God and it's like, you know, you enter a new country and there's new laws, so now you have to obey the new laws and it doesn't matter where you were before and it's not considered a crime if you did it before, but now there's new rules, so you have to obey the new rules. Um, so taking uh, examples from before the Bible was given uh, to, for today is not exactly a good idea. And obviously, um, pedophilia is wrong um, because the reason why in Judaism, uh, when you're at the age of 13, you only then become a bar mitzvah, a person that is independent to fulfill the commandments, is because till then, you're pretty much your parents' property. You're pretty much owned by your parents or under their supervision. And they're, you're under their... Um, you know, you're just like almost like an extension of them and you're under their responsibility and you don't have your own responsibility. Therefore, you're not obligated, if it's a boy, it's 13, if it's a girl, 12, to fulfill the commandments. Um, so that being said, um, if someone's thinking of consensual relations with a child, with a minor, then just have that in mind. And of course... Um, uh, today they, you know, most things are at the at the age of eighteen, so I think that's a very good thing because even though the person becomes bar mitzvah when he's thirteen, he just leaves his um, the yoke of his parents, uh, yoke of being his parents' responsibility, and now he starts to become independent. Give him till eighteen, from thirteen to eighteen, to acquire some knowledge and life skills, and then make his own decision. So just like cigarettes, or I don't, I'm not sure what the age of cigarettes is when it's legal, or, or alcohol, because you don't want someone to ruin their life or to ruin their health um, before they're wise enough to uh, understand what that means and what, you know, uh, what that could do to them. So I think that um, the laws in place are perfect, and anyone that's trying to... Uh, uh, take away these status quos um, should be um, investigated and he should also be he should also try to take a different personally he should try to take a different channel in solving the issues a lot of times uh, pedophilia is an inherited problem uh, someone was molested and he's a victim and now he's looking for new victims so this is a, like an issue that's going on so in that respect you know get help but don't try to legalize, don't try to fight this war because it's not uh, not the time and not the place, I don't think. Of course, if we see drastic changes in the educational system and drastic changes in the way people learn and develop um, and, and then things change, so then maybe. Now, obviously, you know, halakhically in the Bible, uh, you know, the law is that any any relationship in this in this aspect before um, the age of bar and bas mitzvah for Jews um, is considered uh, never happened or not no big deal, but obviously the times change and the customs change. You know, just like we don't drive horse and wagons anymore, we drive um, cars. So the same thing is, you know, you have to you have to be aware of the changes of the times and respect that.